the impedance and reactance of the uh, coax as part of the antenna system. Whereas in the quadrature design, yeah, they're part of it, but you end up with uh, no X sub zero numbers, inductive and capacitive reactances, and therefore when you run Crispin, it flattens out the standing wave ratio to the uh, transmitter across a huge swath of the band. I end up uh, operating as low well as 36, 3.6, all the way up to 4 meg. And it averages uh, one and a half to two to one ratio of standing waves. So, but the really big thing was when you get the currents correct due to the propagation of the feed lines, it ends up improving the pattern. It ended up, um, I'm sure, you know, Dave in uh, the UK was saying he kept consistently seeing 25 dB, which is absurd. And I got that reports from a number of stations in Europe. So. I must have been lucky on one respect because of the ground coupling is also a huge part of the array and it's being up 50 feet, 60 feet, it just happens to match the correct height above ground uh, for the phase angles I've chosen. And anyway, too much information. Go ahead, Rich, W1IA. Oh, what is the take the takeoff angle, uh, you know, forward? Oh, it's 45 degrees. Um, 45 degree takeoff angle, and the theoretical was 18 dB uh, with 4 dB front, uh, so the front to back ratio, but now I know those numbers are different, they're much higher, so there you go. Well, what's, uh, what, what's, what, what is the uh, gain, say, at, um, I don't know, uh, 70 or 80 degrees, you know, high angle stuff? Uh, the 3 dB roll-off, uh, the takeoff angle, let me bring up the model real quick. Uh, I was playing with it last night trying to figure out some new information. Um, let me change the frequency. I have been tooling around with the model. But for the design, let me see, 3.850, and there we go. Let me bring up the two-dimensional plot with the data, and then I can move the azimuth. So at 45, uh, now they measure it in dBi, so the maximum gain on that slice is, um, let's see, 9.69 dBi, which I believe equi equivalent to around 4 dB. At 90, where do you want me to look? 45, 90 degree angle? Hang on. Uh, let me move the uh, slice up, and there we go. That's 90 degrees, oh, basically straight up you're looking at, is 5.86. Over. <coughs> All right, so it's uh, more like looking to a dipole, I guess, straight up. Now, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're feeding that with coax, and I'm pretty sure it's resonant down you know, in the DX portion of the band, so where does it all start falling apart? I'm gonna run and grab a cup of coffee, I'll be right back, W3MMR. Alright, Perry. Alright, Perry, we'll catch you in a bit. Um, yeah, where you start the real, well, 3dBs are typical uh, for your measurement points, and when you go to the back of the array, uh, the pattern is pretty much a big fat balloon all pushed over. But the back of the array, uh, as soon as you go uh, over the top and start coming down, it's not linear by any means. Uh, the biggest uh, numbers on front to back, let's see, put it this way. Let me go to 45 degrees of the direction, and I'll tell you exactly what it is. Uh, minus 25.36 dBi. Yeah, that's where it would start falling apart first is the uh, front to back, right? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the three-dimensional plots, Rich, it, and you can move it around, but it is huge. As soon as um, you go over the top, the signal strength drops exponentially. So, for example, let me uh, run it back up to... Uh, the opposite side, say 
the equivalent uh, angle at 45 degrees off the back is minus 4.59 dBi. So, but anyway, <clears throat> the front to back is is off the chart. And of course, that depends on the compass. The beam width of the array is 61.7 degrees at 23.7 degrees of uh, of compass heading and 85.4. So. There's your beam width, the 61.7 from center. Over. Now, what model are you using? I'm back to be 3 mmr What modeling program? I'm running a full full copy of Easy Neck 5.0. Okay, yeah, I've been using MMA and A, um, and modeled, you know, my doublet. It's obviously, you know, a lot simpler than than what you're modeling, um, but. At the height, you know, where mine is and the way it's oriented, it came up 5.72 dBi at 88 degrees is is the max uh, dBi at, the, at that takeoff angle at 88 degrees. So this thing's basically, you know, a cloud burner. Um, at 45 degrees, let me look at it here, 45 degrees, it's only, it, it's down to 2.5 dBi. Um, so, so just to give you an idea of yours, the way it's set up compared to, to basically an a, uh, a regular normal inverted V. Oh yeah, yeah. I, w I can send you this model. Is it compatible? Is well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I do have, e I do have Easy NEC. Um, I could just punch in. You know, I, I could take the dimensions and punch them in here, and, and but I can't. I don't think I can swap. You know, one file into another into this program. Well, maybe you could copy the wires over, uh, Perry. I'd love to, you know, have somebody else model it, especially with the feed lines. Um, I've got to read up on it. I just haven't taken the time to go through that tutorial on the feed lines. And that's real critical part of this, on top of which, the, you know, real ground versus, uh, you know, estimated real ground versus uh, theoretical and so forth and that plays a big part and that's something that's a variant that's very hard to measure so you got to take this with a grain of salt although with the testing uh, Mark and I did some testing on it and it's pretty much in the near field as predicted so the models if you build them properly they should mimic uh, almost anything you put out. I've actually also put stuff in the near field um, to see if it interacted, and it's a huge difference. You've got to be careful with anything like this, with the size and the wavelength, that you don't have anything in the near field broadside. Over. Right, exactly. Now this is over real ground as well, and uh, you you can put in you know the ground conduct con conductivity, which is for. Uh, what is it? MS over M. I forget the I forget the actual name of Millisiemens or whatever it is, and that's over real ground and everything. Yeah. So I be I be yeah. If you want to send it over my way, uh, my my email is good on QRZ. I could copy the wires over and um, and put in the feed lines because this 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 program is a lot easier to use than Easy NEC. Uh, that was that that program was really you know making me pull my hair out, and then I I found this and it's. It's so much easier to use. Uh, so, and I can add the uh, the feed lines, um, you know, and everything in there, and, and it's and it's and it's pretty easy. W3 MMR. Sorry, I don't mean to jump in here and monopolize things. Yeah, I'm sorry. What was the call? I thought I was talking to Perry. It is. It's W3 MMR. Oh, well, I'm sorry, Perry. I'm, I'm losing my mind. I don't mean to hog it. Uh, I'm gonna send you the file. I was just correcting the altitude. I was changing this thing around a bit, and the element links. Uh, there's been a few different changes, but um, anyway, go ahead, Rich. So, what is that array? Is it a, a three-element uh, wire beam? Is that what it is? No, it's two-element driven. So basically, it's just one full-size dipole next to another one horizontal, 55 feet of spacing. So I wanted to cut it so that I had the, both the DX window and the upper portion, you know, in this area to operate. So I split the difference. I could have cut it for the DX window, 
but I put it at 3850 kilohertz. And uh, but I use ropes, you know, in the middle and the ends to keep the spacing, and it's uh, supported at six points. On the ends at 45 degrees, up a good 80 feet, I have support ropes and pulley system. In the middles at 90, there's trees on either side to support the weight of the array and keep the, the shape. Really important that you maintain the symmetry on the array. So it's a perfect rectangle at 60 feet. You know, 121 feet long on each leg approximately. And each drop, each coax coming down is RG11. It's all 75 ohms. And there's a half wave uh, at 3850. And then an additional 84 degree stub in series. And those are approximately 52 feet in length. So just the drops alone, 109 plus, so they're around 170 feet of coax on each dipole to the ground of the phasing box. And the 71 degree line is the actual stub that uh, steers the array. So, and that's approximately 42 feet of RG11 that loops back into the box. And of course, the one key factor is a full wave to get to the house at 3850 kilohertz. And that's tuned dead on. So that way you're looking at uh, the input impedance to the basing box. And uh, everything, you know, when I read it, I'm looking at the antennas. Now, at least mutual. Anyway, uh, back to you, W1I. OK, I see. So um, do you have delay lines, uh, or you, you say you got a phasing box. How do you, you switch directions through the phasing box? Yeah, it's just a pair of double pole, double throw relays crisscrossed. So you're basically adding that line to one element or the other. Over. All right. So um, are you using uh, are you using um, you know balance uh, with each uh, at each dipole? I built uh, high current common mode chokes out of 240-61 material, the big round donuts, and I used. A So there's a single drip loop supported uh, on the top so the RG11 won't pull out of the PL on each antenna. But uh, that's pretty much it. So you got a wave plus 84 degrees or half wave plus 84 on each uh, 71 degree line and right at the box. So there's five SO239 connectors, one for each antenna uh, and two for the uh, phase delay and then one going all the way back to the shack and a control line that drives the relay one direction or the other. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, it's important you keep the uh, RF out of those, out of those uh, on that coax and screw everything up. So how, with, with your power level, how many of those 24061 cores do you have stacked? Just one. They'll easily handle uh, quite a bit of power, but since the power is distributed, you know, they'll easily handle, each one could handle the legal limit, but when I'm dividing the power, it's just moot. Yeah, with a low SWR, they'll handle the power, but uh, when the SWR starts to climb, you can heat up. I built, uh, I built, um, balance uh, using uh, 24061 cores, and I've stacked two of them. And I use uh, RG303 just because I have some. And just between that and the 142 is uh, 142 is double shield, or just a single shield. But there's still, you know, Teflon, uh, Teflon dielectric and like 9,000 volt breakdown. 
But I ordered some. I found uh, uh, from Mauser has uh, 24052 52s which is uh, you know, got a permeability a little bit higher than the, uh, than the 61s, but um, not that high where uh, you know you, can, you can't run power to them. And I'm gonna make uh, I'm gonna make a balance for uh, 160 because I don't have a balance on my 160 antenna. And uh, I think uh, that's one of the reasons I can't get a decent SWR on that way. Yeah, that could be it. And that, and, um, wait a minute, that's a horizontal antenna? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the common mode chokes are absolutely necessary. I could have done it the old fashioned way, wrap up eight to, you know, ten turns of eight to ten inch in diameter, but I didn't want the additional weight. So I opted to build the chokes. But 61 material is designed to take high power. Uh, I could have built it out of 43, you know, or doesn't really matter, but I opted for the 16 ones, and I thought, you know, why bother spending the time with another layer when I didn't think it was necessary? I mean, this rig, you know, let's face it, 1,100 watts is the most it'll ever see, and that power gets distributed if you're looking at RMS power, and it's a current point, so being a current point, though, uh, yeah, you're right, you could... Uh, and they could get warm, but I, I don't suspect so. Go ahead, Perry. Uh, you don't want you don't want to use 43 cores if you're going to run power. You want a low permeability core um, if you're going to run power. And 43's of permeability is uh, way up there, close to a thousand, uh, a mu of a thousand, something like that. And they're okay for low power, but uh, high power net. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Perry. It's K1ETP. What time is it? Uh, go ahead. 4.03, 16.03 here at the... In southeastern Pennsylvania, just sipping on coffee. Enjoying my day off. Just took a nice little nap. I was watching uh, the MLB network. Uh, and was on here earlier. I had this little side bank use with my father earlier. Down on 38.70 in the, in the middle of the afternoon. I guess it was around 1 o'clock or so. And, uh, but anyway, back to the antenna, um, conversation here. I was just, um, <clears throat> here playing around in MMA and A, and I had modeled my father's 40 meter verticals, um, which he's using the same method, um, that you're using. Um, I'm trying to find the, where I put the phase angle at, um. I think it was a phase angle, hold on, let me open this back up, 70 some odd degrees, um, I think it was close to what you were using, uh, uh, there, uh, uh Brent, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, his front, the front to back here is 17.92, uh, degrees of front to back, according to the, to the modeling program. And from what he says, from what he, you know, from his real world experience, is upwards of around 20 uh, dB or so. Uh, so that's that's the way to do it. And if I had the room, I would definitely do something like that um, because you're as, you're as strong as I've ever heard you down here. Um, so it, it's it's an it's it's an increase in gain, obviously. But you know, being a, being switchable front to back like that is. Uh, is really something else, and I mean, and you can see it. And if you want to, and if you want to do it again, I'm making a recording right now for my YouTube channel. So, um, if you want to do the test uh, again, you can you, you can really see it, and I'll send you the send you a link to the video. W3MMR. That'd be great, man. Yeah, hit the uh, record button, and give it a shot. I was just looking up the permeability on Amadon. What uh, no, just out of curiosity, Rich, but. Stop it. Two material is slick. I have to do some more research. But after re doing a lot of reading about common mode chokes, and let me uh, switch the array here. Hang on. I never want to hut switch it. <laughs> but now point is in uh, Europe. Uh, Europe has one too. But 61 was a good compromise. Um, you know, as far as uh, permeability and be able to handle power. But I didn't take the time to worry about it. I thought that it would be adequate. And uh, 303 is excellent, almost the same. Uh, actually, 303, I'm trying to think that's similar to uh, 1.4. 
too. But either way, uh, the common mode chokes were a good idea versus wrapped up coax. And let me flip it back one more time. Hang on. And back to you, heading uh, southwest. But I've had so much fun. I've got a little bit of tweaking to do to balance the two antennas. I want to take and double check uh, the half wave drops. I have a better technique uh, for finding the center, which I should have employed when I was building it. And I didn't even take the time to really fuss with those because I just assumed that the 90 degree shift uh, system would have been adequate. But then when I did the Crispin phasing, the reason I, I I really want to balance it is the when you switch the array they get ever so slight difference in standing wave and normally it doesn't matter on the on the big amp but on the uh, class E transmitter you know it really should do a little bit of retweaking to get the back porch on the class E waveform and that's just a damn nuisance so I want to go out and double check everything and then finalize it and seal up all the connectors I haven't sealed everything yet because I was still uh, working on it what I want to do is drop the two antennas to the ground. I have mutual conductance. When you're using an analyzer and you've got another element in the near field, <laughs> it screws up the readings. So you've got to pay real particular attention. And I hope that's... Uh, I'm going to flip it back one more time and then send it to Rick. All right, back to the uh, north, uh, northeast into Europe. Uh, go ahead, Rich. W1. Yeah, I heard some uh, musings from the peanut gallery there out of southern Connecticut. Yep, I do see a difference. I'm definitely seeing a difference tonight. I mean, it was uh, 15 to 20 dB again. And it's, uh, you know, I'm using a big S meter here with the SDR. I mean, you'll see it. Uh, and you, and you, can, you, can, it's, you don't even need the S meter. I mean, you go from being, you know, really almost full quieting to almost barely in there, so... Um, it's working good. Good evening, Clark, as well. There's Clark in there a bit ago. Now, I'm actually looking at receiving antennas here for the house um, for 160 because I'm using this antenna hooked up as a long wire, um, shorted as a long wire. So it's basically on 160, it's 160, it's a vertical with a capacitance at. And I'm using, I got a bunch of ground radios outside, and it works good. Uh, but as far as receiving goes, it's very noisy, and um, I receive much better with this thing hooked up as a as a short dipole on 160. So I'm just trying to figure out maybe a receiving antenna idea for for my small city lot here. So anyway, yeah, Brent. I mean, that's it's it's amazing what it's doing. <laughs> Yeah, I want to make sure I was on the right pattern. Well, thanks again, Perry, for the doing that. And uh, <laughs> I had to write it all up so that somebody doesn't have to take the guesswork, you know, take the guesswork out of it. You'll be surprised how little information I found on horizontally polarized driven arrays with two elements. I mean, yes, a lot of it converts over to vertical designs, but when it comes to little details, you know, I just didn't dawn on me, how the hell do you deal with an 84 degree line and get it to the ground? Well, of course, you run half waves to uh, trans transpose the input impedance to the uh, feed point. Duh. <laughs> so, a lot of it should have been intuitive, and, I, and Dave said, oh, that's silly, you just add a half wave, and just add the uh, additional links. But there's, um, I want to read up on that Chrisman phasing. It's been around for quite a while. The guy, Mr. Chrisman, that de de developed it, obviously did his homework. I've seen some spreadsheets that people have written up, and um, i got to read the paper on it. Anyway, not to beat up this subject, but I still have 160 to put up, Rich, and I'm still puzzled as to why uh, you're having some trouble with swir on the 160 antenna. You've got a big old tower. I'm assuming that thing is pretty high. Uh, K1ETP in the group, W1IA. Big signal in New Jersey there, uh, Brent. W2DTC. Wow. Hi, Ken. How are you? Man, I've been listening for a couple minutes, and, uh, man, you really got that uh, antenna working, you know, working into Europe with those kind of signal reports. 
ferocious. W1IA, W2DTC. Wow, you've been missed. Where the hell have you been? Haven't talked to you in a dog's age, Ken, back in February of 2011. Uh, really great to hear you. Go ahead, Rich.